We're going to continue this teaching series through the Joseph, and I want to invite you to turn to chapter 42 of Genesis, chapter 42 of Genesis, as we continue looking at the life of, of Joseph. Before we go to uh, chapter 42, I want to take us to chapter 37, just to make sure there's some context and some background. And we're not losing everyone. Everyone's on the same train. You know, we're going down the street here. And, and, uh, and so chapter 37, Joseph is 17 years old when he sold from the pit. He's thrown into this pit by his brothers and he sold from the pit into Potiphar's house. He makes his way from the land of Canaan in the north to the south to Egypt and sold into Potiphar's house. We find that chapter 37 of Genesis. Joseph is 17 years old. Of age. Chapters 39 through 41, Pastor Mike brought a strong word last week about uh, Joseph's time in prison. He's in prison for being wrongfully accused. We know that he's there for at least two years. He's in prison. So he was in the pit. Then he was in Potiphar's house. Now he's in prison. And through it all, what we will see at the end of uh, today's uh, our time today is that Joseph will look back and he will see that God had a perfect plan through it all. That God had a perfect plan. Hey, this is encouragement for your life. This is encouragement for my life. That through all the pain, all the struggles, all the tragedies of life, all the experiences that we go through, that God has a plan. God has a plan question to consider is what is your limit in trusting God? What is your limit in trusting God? Through it all, Joseph trusted God. His faith was in the Lord, his God. And so what is your limit in trusting God? I love what Job says. Job says, though he slays me, yet I will hope in him. Job 13, 15, even if he kills me, I will hope in, in him. So if, even if it means death, I will still hope in him. His limit, Job's limit, he had everything. If you remember the Old Testament prophet Job, he had everything and he lost it all. And what he says is, even if it means death, I will still hope in him. I will still trust in, in him. Chapter 41, the end of chapter 41 before we dive into to the text today, chapter 42, Joseph, we find a, another important uh, timeline in the life of Joseph. Joseph is 30 years of age, according to verse 46, when he interprets Pharaoh's dream, uh, and then Pharaoh entrusts Joseph. He, he, he releases Joseph from the prison to then serve under him. He's second now in command over all Egypt. It's interesting to note that Joseph had to go through the pit. Joseph had to go through the uh, Potiphar's house. Joseph had to go through uh, a prison. Joseph had to go through all this pain to find himself in the position of being second in command over Egypt. Joseph's 30 years old. He's, he's married. He predicted seven years of abundance, then seven years of, of famine. During the seven years of abundance, he has two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. You can see that in verse 51 and verse 52 of chapter 41 of Genesis. He has two sons during the seven years of abundance. And then let's look at chapter 42, verse 1. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at each other? Listen, he went on. I have heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we will live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he thought something might happen to him. Pause, we see that Jacob uh, and his family are in need of grain. The famine has hit not only Egypt, but has spread. It's spread throughout the region. This is probably year two because they would have had supplies. 
and probably year two of seven of the famine uh, in Egypt, some 22 years have passed, 22 years have passed since Joseph was sold into slavery. Jacob tells his sons, why are y'all looking at each other? <laughs> go, go, go down to Egypt. There's grain there. Go down and so that we don't die. Now, Jacob was promised by God in chapter 28. Chapter 28, God makes three promises to Jacob. What are those three promises? He promises his protection. He promises his presence. And he promises his provision. Even when there is a famine spread throughout the region, God is still able to provide. When you believe a promise from God's word and act on it, your faith increases. I want to challenge you in on this. I want to challenge us today to hold tightly to the promises of God, even when life doesn't go our way, gets overwhelming, challenging. Hold tightly to the promises of God and act on those promises. And as a result, our faith in the living God increases. It's a beautiful thing when our faith in God increases. We see in verse 3, 10 of Joseph's uh, brothers uh, left, made this journey to Egypt. This journey was a, about a 300 mile journey round trip. 300 mile journey round trip. They take only 10. What does that mean? Benjamin is left behind. Jacob had two sons with the one whom he loved. Her name was Rachel. One of the sons is Joseph. The other son is Benjamin. And Jacob's like, there is no way that I'm allowing you to take Benjamin with you on this journey. So y'all go. Benjamin is staying here. I mean, the last time he entrusted uh, Joseph to go out and check on his brothers, he never came home. You think he's about to give up Benjamin? I don't think so. Benjamin is staying home. Look at verse 5. The sons of Israel were among those who came to buy grain. For the famine was in the land of Canaan. Joseph was in charge of the country. He sold grain to all its people. His brothers came and bowed down before him. You might want to note that. With their faces to the ground. Verse 7, when Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. From the land of Canaan to buy food, they replied. So the brothers, also note this, they, they came, of course, to buy food. But is that what they really needed? We'll get to that uh, in just a moment. We see that there's a famine in Egypt, just as Joseph had predicted. There's a famine there's a famine in Egypt that spread throughout the region. E Egypt relied on the flooding of the Nile River. And, and this, is, this, is, this is important. Without water, uh, there is no life. Uh, Canaan relied on rain. Without rain, without, of course, water, there is no life. There is death. A and, and that's true in the area of agriculture, but it's also true with people as well. They need it all. All life. As This is how God designed and created life going all the way back to the beginning account. Amen? And so there's no rain. There's no water. Uh, meaning there's no, no, no life. Verse 6. Verse 6. Did you note that? Joseph was in charge of the country. Second in command. Under Pharaoh. He sold grain to all its people. His brothers came and bowed down before them with their faces to the ground. Now, he had this dream in chapter 37. You remember this dream? Joseph has this dream, and, and, and he interprets the dream that his brothers are going to bow down, and they're like, you're crazy. We're not bowing down to you. And then he has a second dream. You remember the dream? Mom and dad are bowing down, and the brothers as well. Dad, Jacob was like, you're crazy. We're not bowing down. As a result, the tension 
was already there between Joseph and his brothers because he was a, 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 a favorite. He was a favorite son born of Rachel whom Jacob loved. So the tension was already there when he had this dream. And the older brothers say, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work this way. We're not bowing down to you. What do they do when they get to Egypt? They bow down to him. Now, this won't be the last time that they bow down to him, but this is the first time that they bow down before Joseph. They just don't know that it's him. Now, in this moment, you, 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 you imagine being Joseph. I mean, in this moment, here you are. You've been through all of this, all of this pain. The people that should have been there for you have ripped this gifted robe off, thrown you in the pit to die. Said, no, nah, we can make a little bit of money, have a better conscience. Sold you into slavery. I mean, you think about Joseph in this moment. 22 years have passed. He's wondering, is dad still alive? Is Benjamin still alive? You think about this with me for a moment. There's a great famine. He's risen to, uh, to such a trusted position in leadership. He's made this area now home. And here comes his brothers for food. Bowing down before him. If there were ever a moment to send the brothers immediately to jail, execute them, or send them home with nothing, it would be in this moment. What we're going to see today in chapters 42, 43, 44, 45 is that forgiveness is a choice. In this moment, in this moment, a flood of emotions that must have come over Joseph. He, he remembers all that he went through. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. It's been said that forgiveness separates the men from the boys. Ladies, I don't want to leave you out. Forgiveness is what separates the women from the girls, okay? Okay. It, 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 forgiveness is what really, it, it's a beautiful gauge of maturity. It, am I able to rise above and do the hard thing that the rest of the world doesn't want to do? Am I able to trust God enough knowing that I've been forgiven and my proper response to the forgiveness that I've received is to now forgive others? Forgiveness is a choice. I mean, it's easy to love people that love, that love you. It's easy to, to like being around people that, you know, there's common interest that, that, that have helped you, that when you call, they actually pick up their phone. You know what I'm talking about. It, it, it's easy to be there for those people in those moments, but the people that hurt you, this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Would you write that reference down? Such a key scripture. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I tell you, this is what Jesus says, but I, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Do you see that? This is what Jesus says. Completely counterculture. Like, nah, the world, like, fight, fight them. <laughs> Hate them. Remove them. Jesus says, love them. Love the people that have wronged you. Love the people that oppose you. Love them and pray for them. Such healing, such growth takes place when we practice Jesus' commands to love people and to pray for people. Listen, forgiveness is a choice. It's a choice. Look at verse 8. Although Joseph recognized this, his brothers, they did not recognize him. Joseph recognized his brothers. They did not recognize him. Joseph remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the weakness of the land. No, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. They said, we are all sons of one man. We are honest. <laughs> Do you see that? <laughs> We're honest. Your servants are not spies. I mean, maybe they're honest about that. <laughs> no, 
Verse 12, no, he said to them, you have come to see the weakness of the land. But they replied, we, your servants, were 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no longer living. So the brothers give a little bit of insight to Joseph in this, in this first encounter. Uh, they, he recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. Why is that? Well, 22 years have passed. A couple changes might take place over 22 years. I don't know. Maybe ask the 22 years back younger person of you. Uh, some, some of y'all maybe not even born then. Uh, <laughs> still wearing diapers or something. But, but not only that, the bigger picture is the Egyptian culture was completely different. It was completely different than the Hebrew culture. Uh, their, their, their clothing was different. The, the men would have shaved heads and goatees. The practices were different. The language was different. It was all different. And so Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. And then we see in verse 9, Joseph remembers. Every time you remember a person that has wronged you, hurt you, stabbed you in the back, Every time you remember, you have a choice to make. What will you do with that choice? What will your response be? Look at verse 14. Then Joseph said to them, I have spoken. You are spies. This is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one from among you to get your brother. The rest of you will be imprisoned so that your words can be tested to see if they are true. If they are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. So Joseph imprisoned them together for three days. Let them think about it a little bit, you know, a little time. Let, let you think about it. Uh, on the third day, verse 18, on the third day, Joseph said to them, I fear God. Do this and you will live. If you are honest, here's the test, right? If you are honest, let one of you be confined to the uh, guardhouse while the rest of you go and take grain to re relieve the hunger of your households. Bring your youngest brother to me so that your words can be confirmed. Then you won't die. And they consented to this. Look at verse 21. Then they said to each other, obviously, obviously, we are being punished. So they have this conversation, different language. Think They, they don't know it's Joseph. They just know, uh, know that he's an Egyptian official. They say this, obviously, we are being punished for what we did to our brother. We saw his deep distress when he pleaded with us, but we would not listen. That is why this trouble has come to us. But Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to harm the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must account for his blood. They did not realize, verse 23, they did not realize that Joseph understood them since there was an interpreter between them. He turned away from them and wept. Pause there just for a moment. They have this, this conversation. They think it's in a language that no one else can understand. They don't know that it's Joseph standing here and they're recounting the story. Of him pleading with us for his life. Pleading with us for his life. And it's the first that we know. Admission of, of any wrongdoing by the brothers. It's the first ad admission of, of guilt in any way that, that we read about. And, and I would say that uh, admitting guilt is always the first step to healing. There's something about that, that word that's confessed. Uh, that, that mistake that's confessed. That sin that's confessed. It, it's so important to your life and, and my life that we acknowledge the, the moments that we miss it. We confess it. And find healing. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13. Would you write that reference down? Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, The one who conceals his sins will not prosper. The one who conceals his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. Do you see that? 
Whoever, whoever confesses and turns will find, we'll find mercy. We see the response in verse 24 of Joseph. Having heard this conversation, what does he do? He's so overcome with emotion that he weeps. Now this is the first of six times that we will read about from chapter 42 to the end of Genesis chapter 50. Six times we find that Jacob, uh, Joseph weeps. The first is obviously here, verse 24. The second is when he sees Benjamin, his, his, his brother, in chapter 43, verse 30. The third is when he reveals himself to his brothers in chapter 45, verse 2. Uh, the next is when he assures his brothers of forgiveness, chapter 45, verse 14. Then when he sees his father, he weeps, chapter 46, verse 29. And then finally, when Jacob, his father, dies in chapter 50, verse 1, he weeps again. And I would say this, when it comes to weeping, what makes you weep, I believe, is a test of, of character. A test of, of a character. What, what makes you weep is a test of character. There's this idea that only weak people weep. And I think that is completely a false idea. As scientifically proven, there's healing that comes through our tears. It's a part of the grieving process, how God designed our bodies. And far too many people try to bottle all their emotions up, and I'm strong. When the strongest thing at times to do is to allow those tears to release. I believe uh, weeping is a test of our character. Weeping reveals our, our heart. Certainly in this moment, Joseph, as he overhears the conversation, overhears what he has just uh, endured over the past 22 years, he loses it. He weeps. Weeping reveals your, your heart. Our Savior Jesus, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, says that he was acquainted with grief. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with, with grief. Isaiah 53, 3, the prophet describes. Three times in the New Testament, we find that our Savior Jesus wept. Luke chapter 19, verse 41, Jesus weeps. John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus weeps. And the author of Hebrew describes Jesus weeping. Chapter 5, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. Three times our Savior Jesus wept. His tears, Jesus' tears are a reminder that he loves sinners and cares for every soul. Weeping reveals our, our heart. Weeping, weeping reveals our level of compassion. And I would go all the way to say even our, our maturity. And so he turns and he weeps. Look at verse 24 again. When he turned back, and spoke to them. He took Simeon from them and had him bound before their eyes. Joseph then gave orders to fill their containers with grain. Return each man's silver to his sack and give them provisions for their journey. This order was carried out. Verse 26, they loaded the grain on their donkeys and left there. Verse 24, he takes, he takes Simeon. Do you see that? He takes Simeon. He holds Simeon hostage. Uh, not Reuben, who's the eldest, who had told his brothers not to kill Joseph. Simeon was in charge when Joseph was sold into slavery. And so he holds Simeon and releases the rest. And so quickly, the close of chapter 42 describes that these brothers make their journey back. They stop for rest and to feed the donkey. They reach into the grain of the, the sack of grain and discover that the money is there and they begin to really uh, lose it. They begin to, 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 to freak out. The worst case uh, scenario is upon us that we've actually somehow maybe stolen or, or not uh, given the money that we brought from Canaan. All these thoughts, all these ideas, they make their way home to Jacob. They face Jacob. Quickly, an overview of chapter 43. 
verses 1 through 14, Jacob painfully decides to let the brothers return to Egypt with Benjamin. The brothers describe that the only way, the only way that they're to prove that they're honest people is to bring Benjamin back with him. Of course, Jacob's like, nah, he's not going that easy. So there's this little tug of war, this little tension, but he makes the decision to release Benjamin to go. Verses 15 through 33 of chapter 43, the sons of Jacob face Joseph yet again. They face him yet again. What happens this time? Joseph invites them to dinner. They think this is strange. <laughs> you know, why are we being invited to, to dinner? Uh, we, we also find at the end of chapter 43 that Joseph has this emotional meeting with Benjamin. Uh, it, it's his blood brother. He hasn't seen him. And he has this emotional meeting. Th then uh, the, they have dinner. And, and there's a, uh, the, the dinner tables are segregated. Why? Because Hebrews can't eat with Egyptians. Egyptians can't eat with, with Hebrews. There's a segregation. Then Joseph assigns the seats of his brothers by age, and they all look at each other astonished. H how did, is this just chance? No, there's no, there's no just lucky. There's no just chance. Joseph knew he assigned them, and they start looking at each other with, with astonishment. Chapter 44, verses 1 through 17, Joseph sends them on their, their way, sends them Back on their way. He puts, again, puts the, the money in, uh, in, in their bags of, of, of grain. And then Joseph tells his servant to go after them and confront. In addition to the coins, he also says, take my silver cup and put it in Benjamin's. In Benjamin's bag or sack of grain. And so they make... They make their way at morning light, chapter uh, 44, and uh, the servant pursues them. And they're like, no, we, we don't have anything. <laughs> we haven't stolen. We're honest people. We're who we have said we are. And uh, what do we read? Chapter 44, that they start looking through all of the bags of grain and find Joseph's silver cup in Benjamin's sack of grain. And so they return to, to Joseph. They return to Joseph, and Judah intercedes for Benjamin. That's what we read in chapter 44. Judah intercedes for Benjamin. Judah offers his life for Benjamin and his father. And, and then look at chapter 45. Chapter 45, verse 1. Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of all his attendants. So he called out, send everyone away from me. No one was with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers. Again, up to this point, they don't, they don't know who he is, but he knows who they are. Verse, verse one continues. So he called out, send everyone away from me. No one was with him. When he revealed his identity to his brothers, verse two, but he wept again, he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and also Pharaoh's household heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? And they could not answer him because they were terrified in his presence. Could you imagine? Could you imagine this encounter? I mean, all that's taken place, the back and forth from Canaan to Egypt, all these years that have gone by, the last time they saw Joseph, he was released, or he was sold to the Ishmaelites. He was sold to the Ishmaelites. And then Joseph reveals himself. Genuine forgiveness doesn't parade people's sins. He hear me today. Joseph had everyone else leave. And this was a private moment. I mean, he could have called everyone with this loud announcement. Look what I'm doing today. I'm granting forgiveness of my brothers. But it's an intimate setting where he forgives. He weeps. Look at verse 4, chapter 45. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. 
and they came near. I am Joseph, your brother. He said, the one you sold in a, into Egypt. As if they needed a reminder, this is who I am. This is what you did. But before he does that, he says, come near me. The, the, the Hebrew word is nagash, which means come close, proximity and intimacy. He wanted them to, to feel it. He wanted to assure them genuine forgiveness not only does not parade people's sins, but genuine forgiveness sets people free. Genuine forgiveness sets people free. In this moment, that's what he was doing for his brothers setting them free. Again, the brothers wanted food. I mean, that's the only reason they came to Egypt, right? That was their sole intention. They wanted food, but what they really needed was forgiveness. There's all kinds of thoughts and ideas in our minds of what we want, what we need. I'm sure you've said it a couple times, Christmas season, or you've heard it certainly. I want this or I need this. We got a lot of thoughts of what we want and what we need. But to me, as we really begin this Christmas season, Christmas can be about a whole lot of things. But I believe at the core of it, Christmas is really about forgiveness. Christmas is really about forgiveness. When you take a step back and we really understand the, the full picture that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. I mean, Christmas is all about forgiveness. Thankfully, we don't get all the things we think we need or even the things we want at times. But what we really needed was a Savior to forgive us of all of our sins. Christmas, Christmas to me is all about forgiveness. Look, look at verse 5 quickly. He continues and he says this, so profound and now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves he's setting them free don't, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life do you see that don't be angry don't be grieved God sent me here you talk about trusting the sovereignty of God in all things it's here Verse 6, for the famine has been in the land these two years, and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Why do the bad things happen to Joseph? Maybe you've thought about this. So we've been looking at his life for a few weeks now. Why do these bad things happen to Joseph? Well, well there's at least three reasons. According to the, the text, there's, there's at least three reasons. The first is to save the world from famine. God put uh, Joseph in that prison for such a time as that to interpret when no one else could interpret Pharaoh's dream. And not just to listen to some sound advice, but to put into place the sound advice, to prepare all of Egypt for what was to come. The seven years of abundance would prepare them for the seven years of famine. And so why, why did the bad things happen to Joseph, you ask? First reason, to save the world from, from famine. We see that in verse 6. Do you see it? For the famine has been in these lands two years. There will be five more. Then the second is to bring Israel to Egypt to be nurtured for hundreds of years. Do you see that in verse 7? God sent me ahead of you. God sent me ahead of you to establish a remnant. When, when, when the rest of the region would, 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 would die off, we would be preserved. We'd be nurtured. We would be cared for. 
There would be a, a, a legacy. God would care for his children. And then the third, to, to me, it all works together, but, but listen to the third. It's to preserve, it was to preserve the lineage of the Messiah. The, the blessing was passed from Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, Jacob to Judah. And if that entire family in Canaan would have died off, where would our Savior come from? That family line. And then, what in the world would we be celebrating in December? <laughs> but most importantly, how could you and I be forgiven of all of our sins? How could you and I have a living hope in Christ Jesus? How could you and I have an eternal hope in heaven one day? See, God has a purpose for your life. Hear, hear me today as we close. There's always a purpose for your pain. There's always a purpose for your pain. God always has a purpose. Forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. I believe we live in one of two places. I believe we live in one or two places. Uh, uh, I believe that we either live in a prison or uh, the party. Would you just go with me for a moment as we close? The prison or, or the party. If we choose to forgive, if we choose to forgive, then we get to enjoy the party. We live in peace that passes all understanding that only comes from God himself if we choose to forgive. If we don't choose to forgive, then we live in the prison. It's a dark, lowly, depressing prison. And if I had to ask today or, or guess today, that, that there's some that might find yourself in a, a prison. But God has created a way to join the party. Forgiveness is a choice. And as we take that step to forgive people that have, that have hurt us, that have wronged us, that have said things or done things, if we make that decision, that next step to forgive people, then we get to enjoy the party. Forgiveness is a, a choice. There's an old adage, forgive and forget. You ever heard of that? You ever heard the adage, forgive and forget? Forgive and forget, thank you, one honest person. Okay, we got three now. Some online, forgive and forget. Listen, it's false. <laughs> Can I just tell you? You, you know, I don't ever forget. Forgive and forget. Forgiveness gives you the ability to set people free. Forgiveness might not change someone else, but here's what it does. Forgiveness always changes me. Forgiveness always changes you. Forgiveness frees us. It frees us. We're able to walk out of that prison and into the party. Forgiveness is a choice. And I wonder if there's someone here today that would be honest enough truly honest, not like the brothers, but really honest. Say, I've been hurt. I've been wronged. I've been holding on to something. And today I want to surrender it over to the Lord and I want to walk in freedom. I want to enjoy the, the party. I want to make the decision today. Forgiveness is a, a choice. And some of you are mad at a family member. Maybe for what just happened a couple last week at a, a couple weeks ago at Thanksgiving, or what didn't happen, <laughs> you know, like the pre stuff. Uh, some some of you maybe maybe you're mad at a, a coworker for some words that were exchanged, or maybe a neighbor that, that that did something, kicked over your trash can, or whatever the thing might be. Maybe some of you are even mad. If we're honest, maybe some of you are even mad at God today. Things just didn't work out the way you thought it should. Can I encourage you today to be honest before the Lord? Surrender over the pain. Surrender over the forgiveness. Surrender over the hurt. And allow him to bring such healing to your life. Allow him to bring the freedom to your life. Forgiveness is a choice.
Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Everybody in the house, those online, would you bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment? Just for a moment, would you get alone with Creator God? And I wonder, is there someone here today? You need to step out, take a next step, and forgive the person that's hurt you, that's trespassed against you, stabbed you in the back, that said they would always be there, and where are they? Maybe even some, as I said already, you're struggling with, with God because uh, trusting his sovereignty is such a hard thing to do at times. Why? The questions of why. And so today, maybe there's some healing that needs to take place right here in the house and online. There's some healing that needs to take place. Would you allow the Lord, our God, to heal? Would you confess that person's name? And would you confess what they've done to you? Would you surrender that hurt over to the Lord right here, right now? Would you say, God, I, I can't do it on my own. I need your help. Your word says, because I've been forgiven, I must forgive others. Ephesians 4, 32. And so that'd be your prayer today. People all across this place, just a moment, we're going to stand and the band's going to close out with one song. And as they sing, there's going to be men and women at different corners. There's someone and there's a host online as well. We would love to pray with you. We would love to pray with you. Maybe that next step for you looks like standing up, stepping out of your seat and coming to one of these corners and allowing someone to pray with you. Maybe your next step is salvation. Maybe you've never surrendered your life over to Jesus and today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day that you say, I'm a sinner. Jesus, you're the Savior. I believe with everything in me that you came to this earth, that you walked this earth, that you died on a cross and that you were placed in a grave and you rose victorious on the third day from the grave for me for my sins and so today I trust you completely take my life use me for your glory perhaps that's your prayer today perhaps it's your prayer that's your step Father come before you in the name of Jesus and I lift up your church to you and there's people in the house and there's people online I gotta believe that are struggling with forgiving someone is holding them back and I pray that today they would find freedom in Christ Jesus as they practice forgiveness and so Lord help us help us to take courage to trust you all of our hope is in you Spirit of God leads us to move, we move. In the name of Jesus.